Well, good afternoon and everyone. Hope y'all are having a great day. Thank you for joining us. This is the asset management session. Um, just a couple of reminders. The session is being recorded um, and your participation in um, the session is your consent to the recording. If you have any questions or comments and would like to engage in this discussion, feel free to take yourself off mute at any time. Um, everyone was muted upon entry, but again, take yourself off mute and hop in on the conversation. The chat lines are open and if there is anything we can do for you, feel free to let us know. And I'm gonna turn it over to Thiago, who's gonna facilitate the discussion today. All right, everybody, good afternoon or good morning, good evening, depending where you are. I trust everybody can hear me okay? Just nod, yeah, I'm seeing a nod. All right, and a thumbs up. Thank you very much, uh, thank you. All right, so uh, today we, we, we had a discussion yesterday on asset management. We had three great presenters. You heard from Joy Solomon from Southern. Uh, you heard from Kevin Thompson from Duke and Nath uh, Shabanti from OPG on it, different things that they are looking at uh, as far as asset management, different projects, different approaches, uh, some of the challenges that they've been having and also where they see value in it. Um, and I, I hope that you are able to, to participate in that discussion. Uh, and today what we want to do is continue that uh, but in more, more of a, in a more discussion format, more back and forth where you can really put, uh, give your input. And what we want to do here is, when we consider asset management, um, what are what are the challenges? What are the key issues that that we see if we want to uh, leverage AI for for asset management? Um, and as we look at them, I mean, there, there'll be many. We definitely want to focus on what are the largest ones, the, the largest obstacles that we see, uh, or the ones that take uh, the highest priority that we will, you know, if we solve them, that's what is gonna enable us to effectively and efficiently use AI for, for asset management. Um, and as we think of those, you know, what are the key areas for, for collaboration? Likely, you know, you heard from all the presenters um, yesterday, uh, lots of areas in common, lots of concerns, lots of uh, uh, common topics that even though they had three completely independent presentations, you could see uh, commonalities in there. So, and so if these issues are common uh, and some of them cannot be solved by a single utility or uh, group individually, uh, what are the key areas for collaboration? So if the first one is, you know, we're trying to identify what are the, the key issues, what are those challenges that we want to uh, need to tackle first if we want to enable this. The second question is, you know, how do we do that um, collectively? How do we approach what's the path forward to, to be able to uh, overcome those obstacles in a collective manner? Um, I will say that unfortunately I did hear from Joyce and she won't be able to join us today, uh, but we do have uh, Kevin and Mass on the line as well to, to facilitate the discussion with me. So I'm going to stop here and as, as I said, this is supposed to be, to be a, a, a discussion. I have some ideas here that, that I can propose, uh, but you know, before, before I go there, I wanna give you an opportunity um, to, to speak up and say, all right, um, what are, you know, if you think of asset management, what are the obstacles that you see for us to being able to leverage AI for it? And you can, um, as, uh, as Andrew said, you can unmute yourself. Um, you can put messages in the chat. I'll try my best to, to keep up with the chat as well. Um, so I'll open this up and Kevin and Nath, if you want to start uh, building up on, on your discussion yesterday, uh, that would be great as well. So this is this is Kevin Thompson. I'll I'll start. I mean, I think, and I alluded to it yesterday, but uh, the biggest challenge to me, from my perspective, in leveraging AI and machine learning is is really just uh, the the volume of good, reliable, consistent data that is required for machine learning. You need um, a really good set of data 
over a, a specified time frame as well um, in order for the machine learning, the artificial intelligence really to understand what data to look for and what it what the data is telling you. If you've got uh, inconsistent data or you have gaps in your data or you just simply don't have enough data and I'm talking millions of records, um, then it's it will point you in a direction, but it's not going to have the precision that that we believe you would need in order to make um, meaningful decisions. Thank you, thank you. Yes, yeah, that was uh, my one takeaway as the main point uh, to me as as far as the challenge, because I think that all three speakers yesterday um, mentioned this. Uh, the, the question around data. And as you said, Kevin, not, not only having uh, high volume or a lot of data, but it needs to be uh, consistent uh, and it needs to be somewhat integrated so that, you know, you have information from all the different assets. Um, there's also um, the, the aspect of depending on what you're looking for in the data uh, by the very nature of what we're doing, we may be looking for events that are, you know, uh, rare, and we want them to be rare. We don't want them to to happen all the time. But if that's the very target of your of your concern, when the events are are rare, even though you have a lot of data, um, the data for the events that you really care about ends up still being uh, sparse. Um, Okay, I'll make a note of that. Naz, do you have anything to add to, would you like to add anything to, to that point or, or bring another one? I don't know. Um, Kevin made a very good point of uh, not having enough data, mostly structured data that is accessible for, um, accessible and suitable for machine learning models, um, which somehow emphasize on uh, uh, industry-wide, maybe collaborations on developing uh, these diagnostic and prognostic models. Uh, we all have, you know, specific units. We need to customize every model that comes from such collaboration, but indeed we need to come up with uh, some way of uh, somehow integrating uh, what we all have to come up with a, a solution starting point for um, diagnostic and prognostic model. Um, also, Kevin mentioned uh, the uh, the precision that we have in these models. Uh, the current uh, asset management programs have uh, special specification expectations from uh, the inside that can take the they can take into account and actually change and modify what they have in place accordingly and that would be also good to know how uh, asset management uh, can accept the insight provided from uh, AI and ML models to uh, minimize the gap between the output of uh, AI and ML models and, uh, and uh, the expectation of the uh, asset management programs. Um, of course, as I mentioned yesterday, there would be some expectation from uh, asset management programs to show some kind of flexibility, maybe looking at more dynamic programs to um, uh, to somehow accommodate the, the new insight from uh, prognostic models. but. It, this is kind of two way um, uh, uh, collaboration. It should be from uh, flexibility from both sides. And um, the solution, uh, wherever it comes from, it would be a very good start, I would say, that's going to be expandable to many other applications across company. We can probably start on some uh, critical assets, and as soon as we have some acceptable. Um, uh, output from those models that could be expandable to to all companies. So uh, the the scalable solution that's the other thing that would be considered in in uh, in uh, any uh, suggestions that we have here. Uh, to you know we have uh, we need to have that vision of expanding it company wide to uh, uh, somehow answer the need uh, of newer asset management approaches. Okay, thank you. That's very good. Very good. And um, was was somebody going to to say something? I'll jump in. All right. Uh, hi, Steve Patton from Via Science. I do apologize. There's construction in the background. Hopefully, it's not too annoying. 
Um, but yeah, I, I really liked this session la uh, yesterday and was looking forward to um, having this discussion today. So uh, I worked at a major utility for a number of years as a data scientist. So I was, I was experiencing what you experience, like you need more data and how do you get it? And so the, the firm I work with now is solves it. You know, we, we think about this hard and there's a couple ways to do it. One is you form a consortium, you all do these NDAs and you share data and you, you just sort of send your data around and, and, and pray it, it, it gets used and the consortium stays together. Well, I worked hard at that at building a couple consortiums and it's really, really hard. It's really difficult to, to um, engage other utilities, the utilities, law, uh, legal team and everything. So that's one way to, to share data. Another way would be you have sort of a trusted central authority. And uh, EPRI, I was hoping you could talk on this. You tried this, say, with Transformer Help, and you have your 10 data sets that you're building. Uh, so that's one. That's another way. And that's sort of a um, an NDA way. And the third way is uh, I'm going to I'm going to plug a little bit here, but we do mathematics and encryption. So the the idea is like no more sending your data around. You keep your data. You keep it where it is encrypted. And instead, we send algorithms to the data. So you have a virtual consortium. So your data stays where it is and using uh, differential privacy, multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, uh, you can have this virtual consortium of, um, of, of, of data. So, and, and we, have it, we have it going right now with transformers. We've got uh, four major um, international utilities who have pooled their transformer data for health, health maintenance. So um, just, Again, sorry, sorry for the plug, but I also think it's an interesting solution and and um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go, go ahead. Yeah, well, this is Lalita Udpa from Michigan State. I have a um, follow up comment to what Steve Patton just mentioned. Um, yeah. You know, when we talk about data, uh, we're talking about training data, right? So. Sending algorithm to the data, um, we, we would need first a, a good representative set of training data with, with the ground truth in order to develop the machine learning algorithms. Is the, could you maybe clarify? Yeah, this, this could be your training data. I mean, you could, you could uh, ideally you'd have it labeled. I mean, this, you'd have the utilities of course would have to different utilities would have different quality of data some would be labeled some wouldn't but all that would be in a um a user interface for you like so far transformer product it's in a user interface you get to see what types of you can sort on give me you know this voltage transformer mid mid level transformers and with this age um, and with this history, so, but you don't get to actually download it and see it. Okay. But this would, I, I'm saying, I'm saying this would be your training data. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, so and I'll, I'll just add to that. This is Kevin Thompson again. You know, one of the, the things that we found successful in kind of training the machine learning or artificial intelligence is this concept of. Um, a hybrid uh, learning approach in that we've got decades long uh, engineering analytics specifically around transformers. Those are pretty well mature analytics. They are longstanding. There's no reason to discount those and, and rely completely on, on machine learning, artificial intelligence if you just don't have the the volume of data and so what we use those engineering analytics for is to measure the precision of the machine learning to see where it uh, is kind of telling us the same direction or the same story as the engineering analytics and also where it's telling us a completely different story and then that, that tells us that you know there's still to do on the machine learning but 
what that hybrid approach allows you to do is move forward with a solution. So you're not sitting waiting for the amount of data needed for artificial intelligence machine learning to get here. Um, you can start down the road on this journey now and use the engineering analytics you have alongside with the artificial intelligence. And then as time passes, you'll be able to lean more on the machine learning analytics as you get more data, as that precision proves itself out to the engineering analytics and whatnot. Yeah, Kevin, that, that's, a, that's a great point. I feel that a lot of times uh, with the advent of machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse in, in a way. Uh, it allows us to do a, a lot of very complex, very neat things that, you know, just beyond the capabilities where you can get with just an analytical model because it's just too complex to uh, consider every everything. You know, every model has its own simplifications and all that. Um, but there's also the the other side where, um, especially especially you know, as computing capabilities have increased and allowed us to do more and more, it, it tends to lead us to the idea that hey, you know, knowledge now is not really that much necessary because I can just let my machine learning. Uh, my my deep neural network figure out things for me, um, and that is not uh, that is not true. Uh, it definitely, it is in some cases where you know it's very difficult for you to even tell uh, the deep neural uh, network what to look for, and you know, image perhaps image classification or object detection is one of the best examples of that, where the networks are very successful at you know figuring out exactly what they need to look at. Uh, where it would be very difficult for a human to define exactly what to look for, uh, but you know that ha that that comes at the price of needing a, a whole lot more data. So the more SME inputs, the more domain knowledge input that you can you know put into the system, um, not only you're going to be setting up yourself for you know more chances of success, but also um, you decrease the amount of data that, that you need at that point because you're helping the system along by providing a lot of uh, domain knowledge already to it. Um, I do want to, I do want to know, Steve brought uh, one issue, you know, we've been talking about data as that being identified as um, one of the main issues or, or key challenges here, it's, it's around data, and I don't think nobody would argue that. Uh, but I'll, I want to dig just a little bit deeper to identify what exactly is the issue. Steve brought something up um, that, you know, one of the issues, but mainly, you know, one of the issues is around being able to share the data because, you know, one organization may not have enough and they need to be shared and there is the security and, and all those aspects to it. But um, I just want to take one step backwards and, and and, and, and ask what exactly is about data? Is it is it indeed the fact that hey, it's sensitive data and it's hard to share, and that's the that's the uh, the, the the part that we need to overcome? And um, you know, Steve shared about three different ways that that, that can be done, um, or is it more like we don't have the data? We need to put more instrumentation. Is it we have the instrumentation, but the data is scattered and we just need to bring it together? Is it a format thing? Uh, and I think, you know, Kevin mentioned uh, earlier um, yesterday about, you know, years ago we didn't look at uh, certain type of data as information. So, you know, we don't really have a good record of it or is it just paper records, whatever, whatever it is. Um, but what exactly do you see as, as being the issue with, with data? Um, I can go first, yeah, but if it's okay, this is Nas from OPG. Um, so, uh, data security is definitely um, uh, something to consider. It's a significant obstacle sometimes, even NDAs are not, uh, you know, uh, uh, fully bulletproof and uh, they make uh, issues every now and then. But uh, as a data scientist, it's that's not the first thing I think about. 
I think about the data structure, the different, uh, the uh, different uh, kind of environment that uh, the, the sensor are experiencing, any kind of calibration issue that I have. And most importantly, the distribution of the data, the difference between training data and validation data that I have. So we talked about having a pool of training data, you know, coming from different industry data. So that's a great idea, but we need to make sure that the, 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 the validation process is also using same distribution as what we expect to see in actual uh, circumstances. Otherwise, the, the accuracy that we expect from our model are not really relevant to the situation. And in practice, we're not gonna, uh, you know, be satisfied with, with the results. So uh, the structure is, is, uh, is an issue. Um, uh, for some uh, equipment, we have a, a, a rich um, kind of a repository of failures and consequently failure data, but for some, we don't have such a thing. And more critical the equipments are, actually, the, the, the more unlikely to have a rich uh, uh, resource of uh, failure data because we have, you know, fortunately, we, we, we could have uh, uh, avoided failures back in time, or it's sometimes harder to share such information um, industry-wide. So uh, the structure of data and the availability is still the main challenge that stands out uh, compared to the uh, the, uh, kind of the uh, cybersecurity and the risks of uh, sharing data industry-wide uh, uh, from uh, my point of view. Okay, thank you. So we have added instead of, uh, in addition to data security, like Maz, Maz just brings up the issue of the structure of the data and the distribution of the data to make sure that those things are um, what you expect and enough in, in, the, in the same proportion and things that you need for, um, to develop uh, successful solutions. Um, any anybody has any other aspects about data that makes it challenging, or any comments to to Naz on, on her on her input? Yeah, I would. And this is Kevin Thompson. I, I would definitely agree with with what Naz said that the the structure of the data is is critical. Um, so you know, at least for for transformers. Uh, the machine learning comes in with learning about our failures, learning how uh, the transformer failed, what mode it failed in, the causes, and and all of those kind of things. And if I explain one event differently than you do, Thiago, I, I can't grab that data and associate it to say there yeah. they actually failed in the same exact mode. So until we come up with a standard and and there is the, the NATF uh, failure coding standard that's out there now, until you really get to a point where you have multiple companies using that same failure coding system, you're not going to be able to build the, the blocks of, of gathering additional data. If I'm calling it one thing and you're calling it another, it's actually going to yeah. confuse yeah. machine learning and uh, make it just even more challenging. It would come up with many more scenarios than there actually were. Now that that is that is a good point, Kevin. I put this under here. My notes putting this under data consistency to make sure that you know whatever we're calling the uh, whatever we are. You know this is consistent throughout. Uh, any types of different data sets that we want to 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 put together. One good example of that is uh, a recent effort at EPRI uh, looking at work order data, trying to mine the database uh, from uh, a number of different utilities that uh, can contribute to that and trying to make an assessment not just for, you know, uh, not, not a Flint-specific assessment, but trying to look at across the board what can we see, and that was the first, um, the first difficulty, and, and the first, and probably the largest obstacle to doing anything is that you know what utility A calls something, utility B calls something else, and sometimes that that may be even through true among different plants of the same utility. So this. Um, 
lack of consistency pretty much makes it almost impossible to be able to draw uh, conclusions from the data set as, as a whole, because we just, you know, we have the same things with different names everywhere. Um, and that's, 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 you know, a, a, a good, a good point. So we have here, you know, my notes that I'm noting down here, data security as, as the first issue around data that, that was brought up. Uh, data structure or distribution. Um, and I would put under that uh, based on what, you know, the discussion that, that Naz had, um, you, you know, think of failures and events, if they are rare, um, that makes the, makes it challenging. Um, and based on this last comment by Kevin, I'm putting just data consistency uh, to make sure that, you know, we have uh, things, if we want, especially if you want to uh, consolidate databases or, or whatever, uh, the data needs to be labeled and um, the terminology needs to be consistent throughout, or we won't be able to go very, very far. Um, any others? Kevin, this is uh, Praveen Kumar with uh, Zest Labs. Uh, I just wanted to make, uh, yeah, uh, just wanted to make a comment on the uh, the issue of lack of sufficient failure case data. Uh, you know, I think one uh, aspect that's unique to asset management, uh, at least uh, based on our experience in the the oil and gas world, is that uh, when you're applying these AI based solutions, typically um, it's critical uh, not to have uh, any false negatives, but a, a small percentage of false positives may be okay as long as there, there's a way for um, an SME to, to supervise the uh, the results. Uh, so we could uh, certainly uh, take advantage of that uh, and uh, constrain the data set. So it's, even if we didn't have examples of every imaginable failure case, uh, you know, as long as the, the workflow is designed so that uh, the AI can fail in a safe manner and there's a, a human uh, in the loop that can still you know, uh, pick up uh, things that the, the AI may not have, uh, you know, caught. So there's there's some ways to, to deal with it, at least uh, from an asset management use case standpoint. Uh, so I yeah, just wanted to make that point. So, yeah, so if, yeah. if you did not have yeah, every single, you know, failure case, uh, it's, it's not the end of the world. We could still deploy solutions that would be useful. Okay, okay. Uh Somebody was going to say something. I would agree with Praveen. It's Steve putting my uh, data scientist hat on. Yeah, it'd be great if, if the data was all like properly labeled and we had all these codes, but even if I just know, you know, if it's just, I know fail, like I can use that data. So a lot of these, some of the utilities we talked to, they only have, you know, 200, substation transformers and their sample size of fails are three so n equals three you know so it's it, you know any additional information they can get by looking at others helps and and so um i would i was wondering what kevin what you'd think about that yeah i mean i to that point, yes. I mean, any data is good data um, in terms of uh, using it. Now, now, some of it you can you can gain a lot more, glean a lot more uh, from it. But you know, to your point, Steve, if it failed, you know, maybe we can at least get nameplate information off of the transformer. Maybe we don't have good, good. consistent oil sample data that that we can. Uh, derive off of, or maybe we didn't record the specific failure mode. Uh, but if we know that it failed, there certainly are uh, connections that can be made with that data. Yeah, like one one anecdote we found was there were these um, transformers from a particular vendor, a not one of the major transformer vendors. Uh, and the, these transformers were all between 26 and 31 years old, so fairly young. 
and they weren't targeted on anyone's you know age based um, um, replacement or, or or models and and um, but across utilities they were able to say like oh you have a problem with that one too you know like it's 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 that kind of thing that um, can be out there and it, and and the data is like yeah we just like you may have limited data points like dj analysis and and maybe a few other things but uh again i think there's still you can do better than like your n of n equals three or n of 200 or something hey uh one thing that and Praveen was was talking that came to mind, and and what he was saying is also that when we look at AI for for our applications here, it's going to be considerably different than mainstream AI that may be using for say advertisement or, or things like that. And um, and the metrics we look at need definitely need to be adjusted uh, accordingly. Um, you know, and I think Praveen used the, the term fail in a, in a safe manner, um, you know, which uh, coming from uh, an undestructive evaluation background, um, still where I'm housed here at EPRI and a lot of the things I do is, is related to that is there's a, a higher concern with, you know, making sure you detect everything. Um, even if you have a, a higher number of false calls, but if you can make sure that you're detecting everything, uh, that would be uh, the most important because that definitely is the most conservative way. Uh, and a lot of times, especially false calls, can be easily disposed of by uh, by uh, by an expert, and you know it decreases the number of the volume of data that they need to to look at is still very very valuable. But it has the idea that you know uh, we have a very biased metric where we we want to uh, get detection over. Precision, for instance. Okay, very good. Um, so we've been talking a lot about about data. Um, we discussed data security, uh, data structure and distribution, data consistency, uh, which is a, a lot of the <laughs> is a lot of the nature of, of the business uh, in, in a way. Um, but are, are there other things? Um, is there uh, anything that utilities perhaps would need to consider uh, doing differently and able to, to enable this? Or is there a need for more instrumentation or not really? Um, is there uh, a need for just a change in posture regarding how we treat data? Um, is there something else there um, that we should be, be looking at that may be um, that may pose obstacles to, to asset management. I think you touched on it there, right there at the end, in terms of how we treat our data um, and strides that we can make to ensure that we have good quality DGA results coming in. Uh, strides to, to make sure that we have uh, nameplate, accurate nameplate information on our assets when we get um, uh, understanding of that, that those are now energized. Um, you know, all those different parts and pieces uh, will only help accelerate our ability to, to lean on machine learning. If we don't fix some of the underlying ways that we've treated data in the past and we continue to to treat it as such, we really can't expect different results. I mean, that's the the definition of insanity, right? Is doing the same thing, yeah. ex expecting different results. Yeah. And so you've really got to change the fundamental understanding of your organizations in terms of data's information. Uh, data is no longer just data. It's no longer just points of information. It it is information that will derive uh, drive decision making, 
and it is it is required now, especially in the utility industry, um, with just making sure every dollar that is spent is a dollar well spent and it's spent in the right place. We've we've got to have uh, more precision with our spending, so we've got to have more precision with our data to allow for that to to be one of the uh, outcomes of of doing that. All right, thank you. Um, so, so recap in here, we've been, again, we're talking a lot about data, talked about data security, data structure, data consistency, and now uh, the point that Kevin made about, we need to make sure that we are treating data the right way. Um, data has a different value today, perhaps, than, than it did um, years ago. And especially if we want to rely on this data to, to drive decisions, like Kevin just, just mentioned, we need to make sure that um, it's being taken with you know, good quality and there's no underlying issues that perhaps there were because of the way you know, we didn't value it as much in the past. Um, but if we want to use it to drive decisions, it needs to be valued now and we need to make sure that those things are coming in the, the right way. Um, before we move on to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how to address perhaps some of these issues or what are opportunities for collaboration and things like that, um, are there any other challenges or aspects that anybody wants to, to bring up? That, and it doesn't have to be data, this is where we started, but is there any other aspects that um, that you see that are challenging or obstacles to, to leveraging AI for asset management? Hi, uh, yeah, Steve again. I'd like to ask Kevin and Naz, the, like their talent pool at, you know, like the, that they're working with, are they outsourcing this? I, the, the utilities that, that I worked for know that it was a handful of people that had the capability to really do this. And I was wondering what your experience is. Um, I can start, this is not. Yeah. Uh, uh, right now, we have actually um, our team um, within OPG has grown, uh, but still, I think it would be good to have some uh, insights from um, outside of the com uh, company. Um, we, we were actually uh, very interested to have some pilot projects going on if, uh, if, uh, if we see some uh, interested candidates uh, externally. Uh, to come up with a solution, I believe that could be actually a win-win situation because uh, we can provide data um, and uh, uh, we can start kind of the uh, validation process with the external vendor as well to uh, come up with a solution that is acceptable industry-wide and uh, uh, kind of that, that would be, we will be the first customers, of course, if, uh, if it's within the acceptable ranges uh, uh, and acceptable by the um, asset management program. Uh, so far, um, that's been a plan. Um, internal development of uh, these programs is definitely something that uh, is um, intriguing, but at the same time, there there's a lot going on in MND Center, OPG MND Center these days. So I believe that uh, external vendors are welcome to, to pitch in. And for for Duke Energy, I think we have uh, been able to to leverage our internal resources, and that's really where we've been able to find an extreme amount of success. We've got uh, a chemist who is is on the team. He has um, analyzed transformers and the chemistry of those for uh, several decades now. Um, we we regularly. Um, consult with with EPRI. Um, we also uh, this this person also has connections with Jim DeCarm and and other folks in the industry um, experts. And so I think you know making sure that you have a, a good network of folks outside of your company, but also uh, leaning into those folks that are that are experts in their own right in, in dealing with transformers over the the last. 
several decades is, or whatever equipment you're focused on is, is really where we found uh, the gold in, in our solution. We've got a, an entire technical support group. They're not the, the hands-on um, uh, construction and maintenance folks that are, that are touching the equipment every day, but they're the folks that get called when there are issues and problems with the equipment and they're the ones that evaluated the equipment prior to any kind of uh, machine learning type of solution. So we're leaning in and leveraging those same exact people to help yeah. build this solution and help help it learn, help it understand where the gaps are with machine learning and stuff like that. So um you know, to kind of answer the question, we're we're leveraging our own internal folks and the strength of them to to build our solution. Thank you. All right. Um, we do have a, a question in, in that was put on, on in the Q and A, and this is completely outside my area of expertise. So I'm going to put here to 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 the panel. Um, what about to do with electrical equipment, what is done with electronic health records? And uh, we may need a little bit more uh, explanation of the question. So Alberto, if you if you want to uh, plug in the audio so we can elaborate on that. Sure. Mm, I, I watched uh, a, a, a doctor from an hospital that uses uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to deal with the exams. And I, I thought that we could um, think about our equipment as being patients and uh, ha having uh, the exams uh, like DJA and other types um, standardized so that we can uh, use the data and, uh, in an anonymized form. We know the type of the equipment, but you don't know where, is, where it is, for instance. That, that, that I, that's an idea that came from, uh, to my mind and I want to, to share, share with you. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um... That is, that is a, a a very good point, and I, I appreciate you sharing. I definitely did not want to put you in the spot, but I really appreciate you you sharing that. Uh, I'll leave it up to Naz, Kevin, or anybody else um, if you have any input or, or feedback to to Alberto's idea there. Um, I can start, Diego. This is Naz from OPG. Uh, that's actually a very good question, as I think that's the approach that uh, uh, many companies are uh, trying to get there. Uh, there are programs like online monitoring that are trying to somehow automate monitoring uh, using similar techniques to have an eye on the equipment and making sure that uh, the, the equipment and systems are uh, functioning properly and whenever deviation happens. Similar to the uh, you know standard procedure that uh, you've just mentioned, uh, the automated uh, systems with um, with alert and uh, monitoring and diagnostic center would uh, identify that. About the uh, um, uh, having you know anonymity on the data, it's um, it depends on what type of uh, modeling you are actually implementing. Sometimes um, when you're looking at a, a kind of um, uh, simplified version of, let's say, linear regression, for example, that would be easier to come up with a, uh, with fewer number of uh, variables within the model. But the more complex the model, the, 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 the complex uh, model is uh, kind of requiring uh, more dimension, more parameters introduced into the model. And then you're actually dealing with the unit load, you're dealing with the ambient temperature, you're dealing with lots of other clues for the model to to come up with a proper um, fitting for the model. And then it comes to the fact that, is it still anonymous? Is it still that just, uh, is it possible to call it anonymous now that I have all of this information? For example, um, some companies are sensitive to the, to the um, uh, information released on unit loads. Uh, 
uh, megawatt production. These things that are sometimes, you know, sensitive information and uh, uh, not having them uh, as a, as an input to the model would uh, would reduce the um, the accuracy and the relevance of the model in some cases. So it's it's kind of I think it's a trade off uh, yeah, on that end, like how much we want to uh, keep it anonymous and how much we want to really spend. Uh, our data on uh, to get the results on this uh, prognostic and diagnostic models. I hope it's uh, it partially answered your question. And um, to to this point, uh, Lalita just put a message in, on the chat that was very uh, very to the point, which reminds me. Um, not that I want to be talking about EPRI too much, <laughs> but. Uh, Lalita mentions that uh, EPRI had a program to generate a database of uh, steam generator tube inspections, and that kept, uh, you know, create a database with multiple plants, uh, probes, degradation mechanisms, which is kind of like towards the idea that um, Alberto here is talking about where, you know, you start to having that patient record for the different equipment, in this case was um, steam generator tubes. Uh, and that is not the uh, the only example. There are there are at least there's a few other examples of similar database. There is uh, Fred, which is uh, we love acronyms. Fred is fuel reliability um, something database, <laughs> an equipment database, something like that. Um, but it's uh, related to fuels, and it's also a, a large database. You know, that as utilities. Um, start to contribute to it, it starts to generate over the years very quickly um, a, a large, uh, you know, map of data that can then be mined and stuff. And a lot of those are, you know, have a lot of structured fields that, that can easily be queried and things like that. So uh, there are some, um, EPRI does facilitate some efforts along those lines. Um, and it depends on, you know, initiating a project, it depends on utility uh, interest, and they have to contribute to to the database with, with their data, and that typically happens. And so it's a, it's a good point, and um, we definitely have some examples for some uh, equipment or, or some applications, and perhaps it's something that we could look for, you know, should be looking for um, more or, or different um, equipment and applications as well. Um, Alberto, does that uh, talk to your to your question? Yes, I think so. I work at CEPEL, uh, Electric Power Research Center uh, at Brazil, and there we have laboratories that do this DGA, DGA and other uh, types of examination of transformers and other equipment. And we have a large database of of equipment, but the, the problem is this: that the, how to to share the, this this data with with others because of of private of the questions of privacy. But um, I've, I'm very interested in, uh, in the data that is being produced by Apri, and I. I um, and my my main concern is about the the alarm data, the alarm data. I think is it is it this the the tenth tenth uh, data data that you are working on. Do you know where it will be available for us to to work with this data that is being organized by EPRI? Um, I personally don't because this is not the area that I work directly with, but I can definitely find out who the contact is uh, to give you to give you that answer. Um, so I'll make a note to do that. And since you were Brazilian, like like myself, I could ask you what what what's your favorite soccer team, but that won't make sense to anybody else on the call. So we'll just bypass that the uh, that Brazilian formality here. <laughs> um, so I did make a note, Alberto, to follow up with you, um, and I will put here uh, on the chat, and that goes for everybody, but Alberto, you can uh, definitely contact me on this um, email address um, to 
to remind me as well to, to follow up and I'll put you in touch with the uh, right people here at APRI. Um, we have about 10 minutes left here in the, in the session. Um, we discussed uh, extensively data, um, talked about different aspects uh, of data. Alberto just mentioned data security again as one of the, um, one of the concerns. Um, and uh, I should have mentioned that, you know, APRI anonymizes data before sharing, anything like that, of course. Uh, but we discussed data security, data structure and distribution, data consistency. Uh, we talked about the way we treat data, make sure that, you know, the way we value and, and treat data today needs to be different than what we did in the past because we recognize that it has different value and can be used for different things, uh, specifically to drive decisions. Um, talked about talent pool, we had a brief discussion on, you know, uh, where is the, the talent coming to do this AI analysis of utilities, which kind of hints a little bit about um, bridging the gap between industry and the AI community, which is part of the reason for events uh, like this. All right, so in the last, that was a brief overview of the things that we have discussed. Um, in the last 10 minutes here, what do you guys see uh, we can prioritize this and see, you know, in terms of, of the data, what are the uh, main challenges that you see, you know, security, structure, consistency, uh, the way we treat data, what would be, um, do you think is the main issue that should be solved first uh, in order to enable, if you see any sort of priority there? In my experience, you know, data scientists is going to answer one thing. Uh, lawyers would answer definitely that is data security. Uh, they don't care about nothing else. Uh -huh. So okay, uh, let's let's change the uh, the direction here, Dan. Um, one thing that we have not talked about is how do you see you know pathways to uh, solving some of these issues, uh, perhaps collaboratively. But what 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 are the opportunities that you see? that, um, you know, we can leverage uh, collaborations or anything like that to uh, perhaps lead to a solution or to overcome some of these obstacles that we discussed. Um, this is Nastia. I really like the suggestion, I think, you've got from Steve to have a, a, a collaborative consortium of uh, uh, data on different equipment. Kind of failure database to have uh, uh, kind of to address the issue we have on the data shortage, and uh, it seems that here and there we might have some resources available as, that is not just uh, um, kind of uh, integrated together. So that seems to be a very good uh, point to start. Okay, so. Go ahead, somebody else. Okay, I thought that somebody was saying something. Um, so leverage this collaboration through databases or the sharing of data uh, in some sort. That, am I very briefly in that capturing what you meant? Okay, can you guys still hear me? Yes, yeah, hear you. Okay, all right. Um, any any other thoughts or ideas on pathways for collaboration or how to solve some of these issues here before I wrap, before I wrap up here? Uh, this is Harvey Vinstra. I'm with uh, American Transmission Company, and. Um, I would like to, to echo what um, Kevin said about um, joining in in the, the transmission forum it's, um, problem coding um, standard. And um, I'm one of the companies that has shared with EPRI some of our data. So, um, and we're still building our problem coding and 
willing to work with anyone. We've shown them how, how we have it set up for our CMMS and um, Con Ed has done the same. So I know there's a lot of people out there that are willing to collaborate and willing to help others um, to get started too. Okay, thank you. All right, any anybody else wants to bring the last comment here or thoughts before before I wrap up? Hey, <clears throat> Steve, um, this has been really great and um, appreciate Epri for doing this. You know, I, I, I would say I've heard a bunch of utilities have done data maturity assessments and it's, I don't think it's surprising, but like they score like a two out of five, you know, like I, I think it's an open secret that um, Kevin, you know, Kevin and has mentioned this, that like, it's just hard to get the data in order. So many legacy systems and things that don't talk to each other and half built projects and things like that. So I would, I would say like, you know, you can either like wait until you get it all built. And I know some utilities are doing that. They're saying, don't, don't talk to me now about doing this kind of stuff. We got to build our internal systems. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's, if that's the right strategy. And, um, I guess I would say that just go for it with what you have. And, uh, I don't know if that's controversial if others agree, but, um, I don't know. That'd be, I'd be curious to hear what anyone says. Yeah, this is this is Kevin. I I wholeheartedly agree with that. You can't, you can't sit still and and wait for perfection. You've got to start moving the ball down the down the road. Um, you know, when we first started this journey, um, we put together a data readiness team, as is what we called it, and. Um, that's really 75% of, of the lift in, in one of these projects. And that team's only objective is to go and pull nameplate, uh, nameplate pictures from the assets that we are focused on and filter our system of record system for any blanks that exist or any inconsistencies on those fields that that we feel are correct uh, incorrect and so we've got four full-time people that that's their job um right now once we finish implementing they will roll off and we're, we're going to need consistent processes to ensure that any new asset coming in the door does not have those same holes but you know that's where uh, the data readiness, filling in the gaps is extremely critical in this mission as well. And, you know, what I've likened it to is, you know, the reason I say you've just got to start somewhere is I liken this whole process in to shining a flashlight into a dark cave. You have no idea what's in there. You have no idea the twists and turns, the jagged rocks, anything like that until you start shining that flashlight into the cave. Once you do, you start seeing different pathways that you never thought existed. And maybe that's where the real world is. And prior to that, you might've had a preconceived notion about where to go in that cave, but it's not until you start shining that light till you really figure out what your path is going to be. And so that kind of circles me back around to, you've got to start somewhere. It doesn't have to be at perfection. Start somewhere, get the journey moving, and then, you know, pivot as needed, adjust as needed, refine, get that precision um, as you need to along the way. Yeah. I Totally agree with that. And um, the best thing, the thing I like to see the most in, in those instances, you know, don't don't wait. Start with what you have is uh, because you may start to get the little um, 
value statements. You can get, you, you probably won't see, you may not see the huge thing that can come up at the end, but you start to see some incremental value and, and that starts to um, justify and prompt you to continue to do more because you can have those um, early values that you can get and insights that you can get from it that you had no idea uh, were, were available before. Um, so we reach out to four o'clock. I really want to thank everybody for participating, uh, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, my notes here that, you know, most of our discussion was centered on data as being uh, the key challenge or the key issue for to um, trying to leverage AI for asset management. Uh, I'll be surprised if this is the only session that comes up with that. <laughs> But uh, we also discussed a little bit what are what are the different things about data that uh, are challenging. We discussed data security, uh, data structure and distribution, uh, data consistency. And I see there was in the chat, you know, comments about uh, you know it's challenging to get buy-in for standards and and things like that, which leads to that data uh, consistency. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, making sure that we're treating data the right way and not like we used to. And uh, briefly just discuss that, you know, collaboration, one of the ways to start with this is with uh, uh, data sharing through databases or anonymized things where um, a larger data pool can be, can be gathered for, for these uh, purposes. And we do have some examples at EPRI, and this is part of what we're trying to do with the utilities where we're trying to uh, gather this data so that we can uh, share it and, and develop things that are uh, equally applicable to a number of utilities. Um, I thank you guys very much uh, for participating again, and uh, feel free to contact me should you have any, any questions. If you want to uh, bring more um, things to, for, for discussion, anything you want to discuss in more detail, feel free to reach out. Um, tomorrow, uh, join in for, for the remaining events and for uh, the discussion. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.